the person next to you and share with them, like in two seconds, when was the last time you were scared, you were woken up in the middle of the night and you were scared from something that you heard like outside the house? Go. For us, this is uh, probably a three times a week occurrence with Meadows screaming at deer outside. But uh, in uh, 2014, uh, this was a difficult experience for a couple named Jay and Karen Priest. Uh, they heard some sounds of dogs barking outside, which was unusual for a sleepy town in Palmer, Alaska. They knew if dogs were barking, then man, dang it, the bears are out in our trash again, or. Someone's coming home late for work. But when they got up uh, in this sleepy town of Palmer, Alaska, in the middle of the night, and went and looked out the window and saw the broad-rimmed hat of an Alaska state trooper, Karen said, quote, we knew right away the dread. It's not good when a trooper knocks on your door at 3 o'clock in the morning. Unfortunately, their suspicions were confirmed as the trooper told them that their 29-year-old Justin regrettably had lost his life in an automobile accident. The car crashed into a tree at a very high speed, the trooper told them. Karen started sobbing, and the husband just stood there in shock. As they gathered themselves, they realized they needed to go tell their other son. They went and told the other son, and they drove 45 minutes to Anchorage. Their son, Cody, collapsed, learning that his brother had passed away. And then Cody said, you know what, we need to go over to Justin's girlfriend." house. So they make the drive over to Justin's girl, girlfriend's house, and as you would expect, when they arrived, Jay paused, took a deep breath, opened the car door, walked up to the house and knocked. And a minute later, when the door opened, there was, standing before them, their son, Justin. The son that they were just told that had, that had been killed I don't know uh, why we were, why they were yelling and screaming. Justin said, I was mostly asleep. I just remember them screaming for like 10, 15 minutes. Praise Jesus, it's a miracle, praise Jesus. This went on for about a half an hour, Justin said. And what had actually happened was there were two Justin priests living in Palmer, Alaska. And you know, police who were interviewed later by reporters said they had made a terrible mistake. they contacting the wrong parents. And, can you imagine being told that your child was dead and now being told that they were alive and sort of measuring your response because you know that in just about an hour, another couple is going to get terrible news that will be, in fact, a reality. People who often go through tragic events report afterward that their perspective on life changes. And how would it not in this particular case, you thought you lost your whole world and then you get it back again, how would that not cause someone to walk more slowly with loved ones, to linger a little bit longer, to cherish every single moment? Like how would an experience, those of us who have had traumatic experiences that have made us take a, take a step back and, and, and look at life at a different angle, how could it not make us see things differently. In fact, productivity experts have picked up on this, that, that, if they, that if they can get people to focus on the fact that at any moment we could die, it forces, it forces a, 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 as Stephen Covey says, you ought to picture yourself at a funeral, but unlike all the other funerals you've been to, imagine the person that's in the casket is you, that has the ability to change your perspective. Whether or not uh, Steve Jobs read that book at his um, Stanford speech in 2005, he said, quote, remembering that I'll be dead soon is one of the most, is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Something magical happens, we're promised. When we see death for what it is, and we see it coming, and we see it soon. 
Now, you may not be aware of this, but there aren't a bunch of verses in the Bible that talk about the way to bring out the best in our lives and to stay focused and to be happy is to think about death all the time. And I think there are probably two reasons for that. Number one, thinking about death all the time is a terrible way to live your life. Who wants to focus on death all the time? Peter Drucker used to ask people that when he, went in, when he consulted with their business, was, he would ask them in the beginning two questions. Number one, what business are you in and how's business? What business are we in? We're in the God business. And what kind of business is God in? God is in the life business. God is about taking broken bones and turning them into life and resurrecting marriages and families and emotions. God is in the life business. But the second reason, this is important, is thinking about death all the time doesn't work. Before we moved here, um, we had this big old Ford van. It was an extended version, 1983 Ford van. It, uh, it, it, it looked like a less sexy version of an ice cream man truck. It was, it was pretty ugly, but it was big. And it was big enough for our family and we would put church stuff in it and that sort of thing. We were at a light uh, right off I-75 near Vandalia and we were parked at the light getting ready to go. And I looked in the rear view mirror and I saw a high school kid driving at 50 miles, behind, 50 miles an hour behind us leaning down, presumably to get a phone. Within seconds, without tapping his brakes, hits us directly from behind 50 miles an hour. We had a big van, it crunched the, the back third of it, but it was so huge that, that it didn't reach our daughters. We had three daughters in the car. I immediately checked to see if they were okay. I ran back to where the kids that were driving back there and they immediately were crying, apologizing, I'm so sorry. I'm like, listen, the important thing, the lessons are later, but the important thing is right now that you're alive. That moment, my children's lives, my wife's life, and my wife flashed between, or between my eyes, before my eyes. That was a transformative moment. But how long do you think it took for me to get upset with Lisa that she was hogging the remote control to the TV? A day, it didn't last. You, you tell yourself, oh, this, this, this is forever gonna change us. I, at this point on with this doctor report from the doctor, that's it, I am going on whole 30 paleo keto for the rest of my life, but hey, that's after lunch today. Where are we going, right? <laughs> what we need is what the Bible calls hope. Hope is something that you cannot manufacture. It can't be given from the world because the world doesn't operate on hope. It has to be given from the outside and it has to be given from God. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter six. I'm so excited to jump into this new series. We're gonna be looking at Isaiah chapter six, seven, eight, and nine. Isaiah is the very first person whom God whispered into his ear about Jesus, that God was actually gonna become a human being. And Isaiah was the first one, and what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at passages that more than likely very few people in this room have ever even read, let alone, let alone gotten into detail on. And so it begins with Isaiah's call in chapter six. And let me go ahead and let me read that. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8 says, In the year the king Uzziah died, this is in Israel, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord, and notice that it's in lower case. I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. They kept shouting it over and over again. And at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. 
Woe to me, Isaiah cried, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes, my eyes have seen him, the King, the Lord Almighty. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. I have a question. How many presidents can you, or can you name the last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten presidents? Lean to the person next to you, the last ten presidents. How many presidents can you name? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you can name them. I can name them because they're in my notes. <laughs> Isaiah was a, what, what, is what was called a priestly prophet. I want you to think of the, um, the Oval Office for the White House, the temple where the, or, or, or close to where the king was. Isaiah lived with the king. Now, if you, could, you had somebody that, if you were a political leader, if you were the president of the United States, like you have the CIA, CIA to give you information, intel in other countries. But if you had someone that could talk to God and you kept him close by, that's a pretty sweet deal. Isaiah was that guy. Isaiah had lived through 52 years of Uzziah, the king, which is tantamount to the Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump and Biden errors, er, errors, eras. Get with the people, eras, yes. And so this guy had been there a long time. Now Uzziah died and it was a, a time of national mourning. Some of you are old enough to remember the Kennedy assassination. You remember when John F. Kennedy was assassinated and national mourning took place. You you remember that because you're 150 years old, okay? But how many of you remember 9-11 and that national time of mourning? How many of you remember when Spaceship Challenger crashed? That's what this experience was. And so Isaiah goes to the temple, he falls down, he's weeping, and while he's weeping, God gives him a vision of something that he sees. We're told that Uzziah died, and so he sees God high and exalted. Here's another quiz for you. You get all kinds of knowledge here at CCV. Highest building in the world. Come on. 2,717 feet high, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. You get it all here, people. You get it all here. Well, just imagine you're sitting at the, the feet of God and it goes up infinitum, larger than the universe. And then there were seraphim that were flying around him. A seraphim is, is, seraphim is the plural in Hebrew. It comes from the Hebrew word seraph, which meant fire. They were fire beings. How many of you uh, watched and you like the Marvel uh, movies? Not many of you because they're terrible. So, but imagine fire guy. That's what these angels are. They're massive and they're completely eclipsing the view of God because they're flying around. And then Isaiah says, in the presence of these beings, you remember in the Bible, anytime an angel shows up, what do human beings do? They fall down, like they, they pee the pants, right? Like imagine just like getting tased. They lose all faculties, they go nuts, like oh my gosh. And he's seen millions now surrounding the throne. He says, woe to me, I'm a man of unclean lips. Now, the phrase woe to me is interesting. It's the way an Old Testament prophet would work. Blessed are you is the way a prophet would say, blessed are you if it was good news. But what I would say, if I got home after a meeting and I was hungry and the kids ate my food or my snack, I would say woe to you. It's bad news, it's judgment. God's going to judge you. 
And what Isaiah says is, woe is me. Isaiah became aware of two things, how holy God is and how sinful he really was. Now, I wanna give three takeaways for us as we start this series. We're doing this series called Hope, and we're asking the question, what truly brings hope? And so the first thing I wanna say is, hope that we have to manufacture is never real hope. How many of you have been discouraged and you're like, I wanna go out, I'm gonna go do something. I'm gonna go on vacation. I am gonna go out to a new restaurant. We're trying to jumpstart things here. Let's get things going. I've been down in the dumps. I need to get moving. Let's go. I'm gonna try something, right? We get discouraged, get down in a rut. What do we Americans do? We go on vacation. We buy something. We do something that will jumpstart our emotions. Last Saturday, God struck me a blow. Ohio State lost. (laughs) Woe are you. Woe are you. It was terrible, but they came out and punched us in the throats. We were just terrible, just terrible. Oh, sorry. Michigan is great this year. They're gonna give Alabama a run for their money. So they just came out and punched us in the mouth. But this Saturday, it was college football day, but my team wasn't playing. So what did I have to do? Oh, let's watch Alabama. Oh, let's do this, right? I've been in situations where um, I've had an opportunity to teach on this passage and the weirdest things happen. I had a couple one time come up to me and say, thank you for helping us walk through this passage because you've given us hope for our marriage. And I was like, that's like the weirdest thing at all. We're talking about God, high exalted. And they're like, no, 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 you don't get it. Like we tried everything. We tried marriage counseling and books and and separation. We tried everything. But to learn that there is a God that can give us hope that's bigger than our problem, that's bigger than our challenges, we're gonna cling on to that God. When we manufacture, we tell people, oh, hang in there, hang in there. If all we're giving them is the manufactured hope that can come from some self-help guru That's not hope, that's manufactured hope. Here's the thing that we have to understand from this passage. There is no hope coming from this world. Everything in this world is fleeting. Every person that you're talking to has limited knowledge. The only thing that can give us hope is the very thing that can't be manufactured, and that's God. And so the second thing I want you to to see is When we say we need hope, what we're really saying is that we need God. Eugene Peterson said is that when you're in a funk, you don't don't need more of yourself. You need more of God. Your husband, your family, your wife, your, your, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors do not need more of you. You're in a funk. You're struggling. You're facing challenges. The last thing you need to do is to be focusing on you. You need an experience of Jesus to see him fresh. Maybe there's been, it's been a long time since you've cracked open a Bible. I would encourage you to open up the book of John. But I'm, I'm just telling you, like you wanna get restarted in your business, you wanna get restarted in your relationship, you need real hope. It's not gonna come from Tony Robbins, as amazing as I think he is. It's not gonna come from Oprah, God forbid, do not hit me. It's not going to come from anybody that you see on TV. It's not going to come from Rachel Hollis. It's not going to come from any podcast, any influencer. It's going to come from the king. It says in Hebrew, literally, Yahweh, the God of the armies, Yahweh Elohim, God, Yahweh, the God of the armies, the one that has ultimate power and creative power can recreate you and your circumstances. Paul said, I wanna know Christ in the book of Philippians. He said, I wanna know Christ. In Greek, there are two Greek words. 
There's oida, which is the Greek word for knowledge. It's intellectual knowledge. I know President Obama. I know President Obama like you know President Obama. But there's another Greek word called gnosko. It's experiential knowledge. Let me see here. Mark Burton. Mark, say something in British. It's awesome. Like a cup of tea. Would you like a cup of tea? I'm telling you, if I had your accent, this church would have 30,000 people in it right now. <laughs> Love British accents. I know Mark. We've been friends for a long, long time. Been through a lot together. I know Mark. And what, what Paul is saying is, I want to know Christ even more. Every day I want to grow in my knowledge and that's what God wants for us. So the, the, the final thing that I want to say is Isaiah's experience paved the way for God to speak to Isaiah about Jesus. Isaiah was in a 52-year rut, and he shook him up right there later years. Some of you are thinking, you know what? God only does big things and new things through people that are in their early 20s. When if they want to lose weight, they go to bed and they wake up four pounds lighter. Where they can start their careers afresh, everything's new. And I'm telling you, when you look in scripture, we're thankful that God helps people in their younger years, but God is always doing a new thing through people like Isaiah. So I just wanna tell you, there, 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 there's, there's hope. There's hope for your kid. There's hope for your marriage. There's hope for your finances. There's hope for your health. There's hope for your future. And it's not gonna come from the world. It's gonna come from the king, the God of the armies. And we're gonna be unfolding that over the next few weeks. Please be here. Let's pray. We thank you so much, God, for what you're doing in our lives. And we're thankful that we can get to know you more and more every day and that that's the thing that can give us hope. Help us to cling to you. Help us to know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.